Hi everyone, um, this lecture is on diffusion models. Um, I gave the first part of the lecture on GANs, and so if you haven't watched that video yet, um, please go watch that now and it will help this make a little bit more sense. Um, and so the concept of a diffusion model dates back to a 2015 paper by researchers at Stanford and Berkeley called Deep Unsupervised Learning Using Non-Equilibrium Thermodynamics. And I know the lead author on this paper is actually a physicist. Um, kind of like an interesting tradition of like people with an applied physics background making some of the fundamental basic science concepts to deep learning. I always feel like if I had time to understand physics more deeply, it would be incredibly useful, but I kind of missed that opportunity by not taking any physics classes in undergrad. Um, but this is just all to say, you know, sometimes like when we, um, you know, follow the latest, um, most exciting literature on deep learning, it's all coming out, people in industry and people using massive compute um, to do really impressive things. But actually a lot of the original ideas, you know, date back to academics who just have a really, I think, deep understanding of, of applied math. Um, and so the idea of a diffusion model is to slowly destroy structure in a data distribution through an iterative forward diffusion process, and then to learn a reverse diffusion process that restores structure and data, yielding a highly flexible and tractable generative model of the data. And so the first part of this is easy. You just have a process that introduces noise into your image. Um, whereas the second part of this is really hard. It's going to depend on the entire uh, data distribution um, and uh, when we have to learn some really hard, complicated um, process, how do we do that um, with a neural network? Um, and so you have this forward process um, where you're adding noise to this image and this backward process um, where their original image is reconstructed um, kind of one step at a time. So the first paper doesn't yield particularly impressive results. You see the training data on the left and the, um, the generated image on the right. And my impression is people didn't pay a huge amount of attention to this um, initially. Um, okay. Um, and um, this um, kind of changes in 2000, you know, there's some other papers on this, I think, but not a ton. And then in 2021, there's this paper, Improved Denoising Diffusion Probabilistic Models. Um, and this paper observes that predicting the reverse diffusion process is really difficult. It's going to depend on the entire data distribution, you know, so we're going to clearly use a neural network for this because we're trying to predict something really complicated. Uh, but what should the neural network predict? Um, and in particular, it can predict the original image or it can predict the noise and then you can subtract the noise out to get the original image, which is an equivalent problem. Uh, but what this paper shows is that it works much better to predict the noise. Um, and so the original literature trained a neural network to optimize the variational autoencoders, variational lower bound, whereas the DDPM paper instead trains a denoising autoencoder, and it shows the best strategy to recover the original image is to predict and remove the noise. There are some other important uh, innovations in this paper, um, and so the, um, the authors on this paper are at OpenAI, and so maybe not surprisingly, they find that you need to um, uh, train for longer um, if you use more diffusion steps. Um, it works a lot better. Previously, people had used like a thousand and you can see that the loss goes down quite a bit using 4,000 diffusion steps. Um, they also find that the noise scheduler matters. All right. So there's this paper and then the same authors like a couple of months later had a paper called Diffusion Models Beat GANs on Image Synthesis. Um, and GANs can employ synthetic labels to improve performance and so when the DDPM paper incorporates a similar strategy, they find that they actually do uh, better than GANs. Okay, and so I know that that was a really quick overview kind of in the interest of time um, and just uh, because I think it's more useful, I think um, it's, it's kind of most useful to understand the details behind this by just sitting down with the paper and looking at the equations, but I hope that this has given you a high level intuition. Um, so now I want to turn to stable diffusion, um, which is um, probably the most um, 
prominent and famous diffusion paper that I'm sure everybody in the class has heard of. Um, and um, so a really important um, insight of stable diffusion is that rather than training the diffusion models on pixel images, um, you know, where you're using the image and like noising the pixels and then reconstructing the pixels or, or kind of predicting the noise at the pixel level and uh, subtracting that out, um, that instead um, you can train on the latent image states that's uh, created by something called perceptual image compression. And this is important because it's m way more tractable because you have this compressed latent space that you're training on. And so you can actually run stable diffusion on Colab. Um, and so this just made diffusion models way more accessible. You don't need to be at OpenAI um, you know, to work on this. You can do it on Colab. Um, and also stable diffusion is completely open source. Before stable diffusion, there was a similar sort of image generation model from OpenAI called Dolly2, but you had to go through their interface and they restricted what you could do. Um, and then, you know, stable diffusion is just completely open source, you know, so some people really hated this and said, oh my goodness, you can generate porn, you can do all these horrible things with this, you know, fake news, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it also just made this technology kind of way more accessible um, for kind of all sorts of purposes. Um, and so as usual, the most instructive way to get a high level overview of what's going on is gonna to be to talk through Jay Alomar's blog post on the topic. You guys can also just go and have a look at the blog post. He just really has a knack for explaining things in a high level way. And I think that with this high level understanding that you can then go and look at the paper and it's gonna make a lot of sense. Um, and so stable diffusion takes a text input. So here, Paradise Cosmic Beach and feeds it um, uh, the encoding of that text image um, into an image generator, which is then going to generate an image from that text prompt. Um, and so specifically, the image generator consists of uh, an image information creator, which is a unit and a scheduler. This is where the diffusion takes place in an image decoder. Um, and for the text encoder, it's going to use clip, just the text encoder from clip. Um, and clip can take, you know, 700, sorry, sorry clip can take uh, 77 tokens and predict uh, the 768 dimensional encodings of those. And those are going to be inputs into the image information creator, which is going to create this uh, processed image information tensor that the decoder um, is then going to take and turn into an image. Okay. And so you see this uh, illustration here. So you're going to have a random um, image information tensor, and you're going to combine that with the text embedding and feed that into this image information creator. Um, it's going to give you, again, this processed image information tensor, which is then going to be decoded into the image. Um, and so let's kind of delve into this pink box, um, which is where diffusion happens. Um, and so each step of diffusion operates on the input latent array, producing another latent array. So remember that um, one of the big insights of stable diffusion is you can do this diffusion process on the latents um, instead of doing it on the pixels. Um, and you, so you can see each of these latent arrays, if you take it and decode it, depending on which step you are in diffusion, it will be a more or less noised version of the image. So this is again kind of in the spirit of essentially um, the um, uh, d d diffusion models that we just talked about. Um, and so you can create training examples by generating noise and adding an amount of noise to the images in the training data set. And this is called the forward diffusion. You know, so this is precisely like the forward pass through. Uh, they go the forward pass through diffusion that we're talking about here. So you're adding different amounts of noise. Um, and um, you can generate uh, many training examples from a single image by just adding different amounts of noise. So you pick an amount of noise and you know how much noise you've added. Um, and um, so this allows you to create many training examples from your input training data set. 
Um, and then you're going to use this data set to train a noise predictor. Um, and remember from the DDPM paper, um, you know, our goal is to predict the noise rather than to predict the image or the latent itself. Um, and so this is going to look um, familiar. So you pick a training example from your training data set. And so that's an image that has had a certain amount of noise in it. Um, and um, you're going to, um, and you know, here it's showing this as an image, but remember we're actually operating on the latent space and not on the pixel space. And so that's going to go into this UNet model. And we'll talk about what UNets are in a minute. Um, and, um, and so that's going to give a prediction for the noise. And then we have our actual noise, right? Because we're the ones that created the noise to noise the image. Um, and we use that to compute our loss. And then we update the model parameters of the unit through RAPR. And so that's how we train this thing. Super, super straightforward, like compared to GANs, which seemed like in many ways quite a lot more convoluted. This is very easy to understand what we're doing. Um, and you know, this noise is predicted such that if we subtract it from the input noise, we get an image that's closer to the distribution of images that the model was trained on. Um, and so this process generates images. Um, and um, so, so far, like what I've described here, that it, this hasn't been conditional, right? And so um, we had just essentially um, start with um, some um, uh, amount of, um, you know, a noise sample, and then we subtract out our predicted noise, and that will give us a denoised image. Um, let's see, as you see here, but in this so far, we're not conditioning on text, okay? So this is just unconditional image generation. Um, and I wanna give a few more details on this before I discuss how we would incorporate a text prompt to condition it. Um, and so a major innovation of stable diffusion is to speed up the diffusion process by running it on a compressed latent version of the image. Um, and the compression and decompression are done via autoencoder. Um, the image encoder compresses the image into latent space, um, and then it reconstructs the compressed information into pixel space using a decoder. Um, and um, so we have this image encoder and then uh, we generate training examples with the forward process by adding different amounts of noise to the corresponding um, latent version of that image. And we, once we've trained the model, we generate images with this reverse process. Um, all right. Um, so how are we going to condition on text? I mean, because this is all good and well, and I can generate pictures of random things, but what, what I really want is to condition on a text prompt, perhaps. Um, and so how are we going to do that? Well, um, we're going to take, you know, we have this noise predictor, which is a unit that we've trained, and we want to train this not just to take a noise um, as input, um, like, but to also take the text as input. Um, and so remember here, we're working in latent space. So both the input noise um, and prediction noise are in latent space, even though in this illustration, it's showing like a picture of the noise, but when we input this, it's in latent space. Um, and so you see here, um, we have our inputs, um, which um, have the step that we're at um, and the diffusion process. And we have um, the latent representation of our input noise, um, and then we have a text encoding. Um, and um, the output is a noise sample that then we're going to predict from the input noise to generate our image. Um, and now we want the unit um, to take text conditioning. Um, so let's first of all just explain how this unit uh, module works without text conditioning, so just doing unconditional image generation. And so you can see that the unit consists of these resnets, um, and they're going to have residual connections for the reasons we've seen earlier in the course. And each layer of the network uses the previous layer's output as input. Um, and so essentially, um, this has um, like resnets in it that look somewhat kind of akin to, to stuff that we've seen earlier in the course. 
Um, and now we want to be able to condition on the text. Um, and so the way that we do that is to add attention layers between the ResNet blocks. Um, and these are also going to have residual connections. And the ResNets don't look directly at the text because the ResNets take the image as input, but the attention layers merge text representations into the latent image representations, and then those are fed into the next layer of the ResNet. And so this is with this attention layer um, that attends to the text and then um, combines that with the ResNet um, latent representation um, of the image, that's um, how we're going to be able to condition on text. All right, um, so that is um, that is stable diffusion in a nutshell. As I said, Jay Alomar's post is great, um, and you can also go and read the original paper to kind of take in more of the details. All right, I also wanna make a quick mention of another paper called ControlNet, um, and you may have seen this paper in the news lately. And so traditionally, late diffusion models have done, like there's just certain details in pictures that they've had a really hard time realistically generating. And like one of those things was fingers, um, and you would just see a, a common artifact of synthetic images created by, um, Diffusion models is a hand would have like six fingers. And I think just somehow like, you know, it's a very um, challenging problem because, you know, conditional having this finger, should there be another one? This was just something that, um, that the traditional models really failed at. Um, and then there's a very recent 2023 paper called ControlNet um, that has a way to kind of control this. And this was all over the news, you know, oh, like now AI can get hands right, like we're all doomed or whatever. Um, and um, so um, I want to discuss this week because we had a really interesting discussion of this in our reading group a few weeks ago and we were thinking about how maybe it can or maybe not, you know, we'd have to try it potentially be something that could be extended to like document generation or handwriting generation. Um, but in the paper, their interest is going to be more on things like, um, like fingers. Um, and um, okay, so the inside of this paper is that using rule-based methods, it's trivial to create very, very large amounts of training data that has edges in it. And these edges can condition um, a diffusion model. Um, so here they use canny edge detection, which is just this rule-based method to extract the edges from the source. Um, and then they generate images with different texts by combining different text prompts um, with this um, control image that comes from the edge detection. And so you can see now um, that um, you can generate these different uh, styles um, but conditioning on the edges. Um, and the paper shows that there's lots of, you know, different ways to get this conditioning data and to get a lot of it very cheaply. Um, so this is Hoff lines. Um, this is um, a scribbles data set. Um, this is um, pose detection. And so there's really large pose data sets. Um, this is Coco segmentation data. And again, in all of these, you can kind of see there is um, what you're conditioning on um, and the image that that came from. And then using different text prompts, you can generate images in this very controlled fashion um, where um, they look different, but they're all um, essentially um, kind of following this controlled template that you can get you know, very cheaply uh, for training from rule-based methods. Here you see the same thing with Coco. Um, and so I don't want to spend too many detail, too much time talking about the architecture. Um, and you guys can go read the paper if this is something that's of interest. But the basic idea is that they're going to freeze um, uh, stable diffusion because they don't want to lose all the general purpose knowledge that they got from training on like a totally massive amount of data. Um, but then they're going to learn this uh, control network um, this conditioning network um, that is going to take um, the, um, the control image as an input. And essentially, it's going to have these um, connections um, across to the frozen diffusion model. 
And so this is um, artwork courtesy of Xiaoyu, who discussed this paper at our reading group a few weeks ago. Um, and um, so um, there's um, the, um, and Xiaoyu, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the top left corner um, was used as a conditioning image. Um, and then um, Xiaoyu asked ControlNet to generate images of different people in this style. And so I think that the images on the right are pretty clear um, what he's generating. Um, but this does have a fail point, um, which is this image um, on the bottom left. And um, Xiaoyu asked it to make this in the likeness of a, fam a famous uh, Japanese actress, um, but stable diffusion is essentially trained on, um, you know, stuff um, like image caption pairs in English, and it has no idea who this Japanese actress is. Um, you know, even if it sees something occasionally in training, we know it's way more able to memorize its training data if it sees something many, many times. And so Stable Diffusion knows who Donald Trump is. That is not a problem for Stable Diffusion. There are many, many images and captions of him on the English-speaking internet, um, but that's not um, sort of universally true. Um, and <laughs> maybe Xiaoyu can tell us more entertaining examples of class of places like uh, where this failed. All right, um, so the final thing I want to talk about is a paper called Glyph Draw uh, that just came out um, a few days ago. Um, and um, like literally just came out like a few days ago. I had like three people tell me about this paper. Um, it was just in time for our lecture. Um, and um, so this paper was released by one of the largest telecom companies in China. And it modifies stable diffusion to generate short, coherent Chinese text. And so the idea is that you're trying to kind of generate an image of something and you might want there to be what's called scene text in it. Um, so this is not text in documents, but there might be text in scenes. And traditionally, stable diffusion did, did not do a good job of this. It was kind of along with the, you know, the seven fingers, it's like another fail point. Um, and they're able to get this to do a very good job. So I don't know, you want to like use stable diffusion to write a, a Chinese children's book of cute little animals holding signs. Um, Glyph Draw will help you out. Um, but we were very interested in this, obviously, because um, we're interested in diffusion for generating synthetic hand handwriting and kind of, you know, synthetic documents, etc. more generally. And so how do, how do they do this? Um, recall that the uh, uh, handwriting transformer paper that we saw um, in the GAN video um, employed a four network architecture. So there's the generator uh, network, which was this encoder decoder transformer. And then there was a discriminator network that uh, was a com net that, to keep the images realistic. And there was a style network to classify styles. And then there was a recognizer network to protect promote accuracy of image text. And so this just, you know, it felt very convoluted and it felt like suppose we wanted to extend this to Chinese handwriting, we worry about how complicated this thing would be to train um, and, and to work with, but it's kind of the best that exists. Um, and so how are they gonna, you know, they're gonna now um, use something much sim simpler. Um, so they're just gonna, first of all, keep pre-training Chinese stable diffusion um, and they have 100 million Chinese image text label data sets. Um, and they're going to do this on 80 A100 GPUs. Um, and so, you know, even like eight uh, A100 GPUs is going to put you out, I don't know, like several hundred thousand dollars, maybe half a million dollars. And so this is really, really a very, very... Um, uh, very, very compute intensive task that you could do this if you're the largest telecom company in China or you're open AI, um, but certainly none of us <laughs> are going to, to do this. Um, but that's what they do. They keep pre-training um, uh, Chinese stable diffusion, and then they're gonna further train a modified version of stable diffusion. And so what are they gonna modify to make this work for generating realistic um, handwriting. Um, they replace the image latent with a concatenation of the image latent vector 
a task, text mask and a glyph image. Um, and um, moreover, the uh, text prompt in Stable Diffusion just uses the text encoder where they're gonna have a fusion model that combines the clip image and text encodings. Um, and so this is what their training data for this second step looks like. There's an image and there's a glyph in it and they predict a mask for where that glyph is and then they have a caption. Um, and this is what their architecture looks like. And so you can see that this is sort of stable diffusion, but instead of just having the text encoder, they're concatenating that with the clip image encoder. They're going to be locking those clip text and image encoders. Um, and then instead of, um, you know, it, for, for, for the input, they're concatenating um, these three things. And so the challenges of this are this was trained on a lot of compute, kind of like open AI levels of compute. And due to the nature of the training data, it only generates short texts, you know, because their whole goal is to generate these scene texts. And it is kind of very impressive how it does this, but it's not necessarily something that we would use to like be able to use to create kind of synthetic training data for an OCR. Hand reading transformers is still kind of the way to go on that. I still think that there's kind of potential promise of um, of this approach, you know, so we were talking in reading group about how, um, you know, maybe instead of having, um, you know, the edge detection of a deer, you could detect key points from characters or key points um, from sort of from document layouts um, and um, use those for conditioning. So as long as you didn't have too many key points in a character, that would give you a lot of scope to have variation in the font. And the good thing about this is it's incredibly efficient to train because you're not, you're totally locking everything about stable diffusion and you're just training this um, control net portion of it. So it's, it's quite efficient to train. <laughs> Whereas in kind of in this approach here, like I said, they're using ADA 100 GPUs to keep, you know, pre-training Chinese stable diffusion on image caption pairs that include scene texts and then doing this, um, you know, this modified uh, version of stable diffusion. So it's very compute intensive. All right, um, so that is what I have on diffusion models and I'm really excited to talk about this uh, in, class tomorrow, kind of both um, our applications of diffusion models. And if people are just kind of more interested more generally in the diffusion models and the place that they're occupying in discussions about AI, um, I'm also really excited to talk about that. Thank you.